Greetings, and bienvenue, mine crew. Thank you for returning to this broadcast. And welcome to new viewers joining us for the first time. If you like a video, then feel free to subscribe. A farmer who formerly lived on an estate in our vicinity was returning one evening from a distant part of the farm when, in crossing a particular field, he saw to his surprise, sitting on a stone in the middle of it, a miserable-looking little creature, human in appearance, though diminutive in size, and apparently starving with cold and hunger. Pitying its condition, and perhaps aware that it was of elfish origin, and that good luck would amply repay him for his kind treatment of it, he took it home, placed it by the warm hearth on a stool, and fed it with nice milk. The poor bantling soon recovered from the lumpish and only half-sensible state in which it was found, and though it never spoke, became very lively and playful. From the amusement which its strange tricks excited, it became a general favorite in the family, and the good folk really felt very sorry when their strange guest quitted them, which he did in a very unceremonious manner. After the lapse of three or four days, as the little fellow was gambling about the farm kitchen, a shrill voice from the town place or farmyard was heard to call three times, Coleman Gray, at which he sprang up and gaining voice cried, Ho, 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 my daddy has come, flew through the keyhole and was never afterwards heard of. I heard last week of three fairies having been seen in Zenner very recently. A man who lived at the foot of Trendreen Hill, in the Valley of Traridge, I think, was cutting firs on the hill. Near the middle of the day he saw one of the small people, not more than a foot long, stretched at full length and fast asleep, on a bank of griglins, heath, surrounded by high breaks of firs. The man took off his firs cuff and slipped the little man into it without his waking up, went down to the house took the little fellow out of the cuff on the hearthstone when he awakened and seemed quite pleased and at home, beginning to play with the children, who were well pleased with the small body and called him Bobby Griglins. The old people were very careful not to let Bob out of the house or be seen by the neighbors, as he promised to show the man where the crocks of gold were buried on the hill. A few days after he was brought from the hill, all the neighbors came with their horses, according to custom, to bring home the winter's reek of furs which had to be brought down the hill in trusses on the backs of the horses. That Bob might be safe and out of sight, he and the children were shut up in the barn. Whilst the furs carriers were into dinner, the prisoners contrived to get out, to have a current round the furs reek, when they saw a little man and woman, not much larger than Bob, searching into every hole and corner among the trusses that were dropped round the unfinished reek. The little woman was wringing her hands and crying, Oh, my dear and tender skilly -widden. Wherever canst uh, thou be gone to? Shall I ever cast eyes on thee again? Go we back, says Bob to the children. My father and mother are come here too. He then cried out, Here I am, Mammy. By the time the words were out of his mouth, the little man and woman with their precious skilly -widden were nowhere to be seen, and there has been no sight nor sign of them since. There was a farmer, and he had three cows. Fine, fat beauties they were. One was called Facey, the other Diamond, and the third Beauty. One morning he went into his cowshed, and there he found Facey so thin that the wind would have blown her away. Her skin hung loose about her, all her flesh was gone, and she stared out of her great eyes as though she'd seen a ghost. And what was more, the fireplace in the kitchen was one great pile of wood ash. Well, he was bothered with it. He could not see how all this had come about. Next morning his wife went out to the shed and see... Diamond was for all the world as wished a looking creature as Facey, nothing but a bag of bones, all the flesh gone, and half a rick of wood was gone too, but the fireplace was piled up three feet high with white wood ashes. The farmer was determined to watch the third night, so he hid in a closet which opened out of the parlor, and he left the door just ajar so that he might see what passed. Tick, tick went the clock and the farmer was nearly tired of waiting. He had to bite his little finger to keep himself awake, when suddenly the door of his house flew open, and in rushed maybe a thousand pixies laughing and dancing and dragging at Beauty's halter, till they had brought the cow into the middle of the room. The farmer really thought he should have died with fright, and so perhaps he would, had not curiosity kept him alive. Tick, tick went the clock, but he did not hear it now. He was too intent on staring at the pixies and his last beautiful cow. He saw them throw her down, fall on her and kill her. Then with their knives they ripped her open and flayed her as clean as a whistle. 
Then out ran some of the little people and brought in firewood and made a roaring blaze on the hearth, and there they cooked the flesh of the cow. They baked and they boiled, they stewed and they fried. Take care, cried one who seemed to be the king. Let no bone be broken. Well, when they had all eaten and had devoured every scrap of beef on the cow, they began playing games with the bones, tossing them one to another. One little leg bone fell close to the closet door, and the farmer was so afraid lest the pixies should come there and find him in their search for the bone, that he put out his hand and drew it into him. Then he saw the king stand on the table and say, Gather the bones. Round and round flew the imps, picking up the bones. Arrange them, said the king, and they placed them all in their proper positions in the hide of the cow. Then they folded the skin over them, and the king struck the heap of bone and skin with his rod. Wished. Up sprang the cow and lowed dismally. It was alive again, but alas, as the pixies dragged it back to its stall, it halted in the off forefoot, for a bone was missing. The cock crew, away they flew, and the farmer crept trembling to bed. Long before Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, there reigned in the eastern part of England a king who kept his court at Colchester. He was witty, strong and valiant, by which means he subdued his enemies abroad and secured peace among his subjects at home. Nevertheless, in the midst of his glory, his queen died, leaving behind her an only daughter, about fifteen years of age. This lady, from her courtly carriage, beauty and affability, was the wonder of all that knew her. But, as covetousness is said to be the root of all evil, so it happened in this instance. The king, hearing of a lady who had likewise an only daughter, for the sake of her riches, had a mind to marry. Though she was old, ugly, hook-nosed and hump-backed, yet all this could not deter him from marrying her. Her daughter also was a yellow dowdy, full of envy and ill-nature, and in short, was much of the same mould as her mother. This signified nothing, for in a few weeks the king, attended by the nobility and gentry, brought his intended bride to his palace, where the marriage rites were performed. They had not been long in the court before they set the king against his own beautiful daughter, which was done by false reports and accusations. The young princess, having lost her father's love, grew weary of the court, and one day meeting with her father in the garden, she desired him, with tears in her eyes, to give her a small subsistence, and she would go and seek her fortune to which the king consented, and ordered her mother-in-law, stepmother, to make up a small sum according to her discretion. She went to the queen, who gave her a canvas bag of brown bread and hard cheese with a bottle of beer, though this was but a very pitiful dowry for a king's daughter. She took it, returned thanks, and proceeded on her journey, passing through groves, woods and valleys, till at length she saw an old man sitting on a stone at the mouth of a cave, who said, Good morrow, fair maiden, whither away so fast? Aged father, says she, I am going to seek my fortune. What hast thou in thy bag and bottle? In my bag I have got bread and cheese, and in my bottle good small beer. Will you please to partake of either? Yes, said he, with all my heart. With that, the lady pulled out her provisions and bid him eat and welcome. He did so and gave her many thanks, saying thus, there is a thick, thorny hedge before you, which will appear impassable. But take this wand in your hand, strike three times, and say, Pray, hedge, let me come through. And it will open immediately. Then, a little further, you will find a well. Sit down on the brink of it, and there will come up three golden heads, which will speak. Pray do whatever they require. Promising she would follow his directions, she took her leave of him. Arriving at the hedge, and pursuing the old man's directions, it divided and gave her a passage. Then going to the well, she had no sooner sat down than a golden head came up singing, Wash me, and comb me, and lay me down softly, and lay me on a bank to dry, that I may look pretty when somebody comes by. Yes, said she, and putting forth her hand, with a silver comb performed the office, placing it upon a primrose bank. Then came up a second and a third head, making the same request, which she complied with. She then pulled out her provisions and ate her dinner. Then said the heads, one to another, what shall we do for this lady who hath used us so kindly? The first said, I will cause such addition to her beauty as shall charm the most powerful prince in the world. The second said, I will endow her with such perfume, both in body and breath, as shall far exceed the sweetest flowers. The third said, My gift shall be none of the least, for as she is a king's daughter, I'll make her so fortunate that she shall become queen to the greatest prince that reigns.
This done, at their request, she let them down into the well again, and so proceeded on her journey. She had not travelled long before she saw a king hunting in the park with his nobles. She would have avoided him, but the king, having caught a sight of her, approached, and what with her beauty and perfumed breath was so powerfully smitten that he was not able to subdue his passion, but commenced his courtship immediately, and was so successful that he gained her love, and, conducting her to his palace, he caused her to be clothed in the most magnificent manner. This being ended, and the king, finding that she was the king of Colchester's daughter, ordered some chariots to be got ready, that he might pay the king a visit. The chariot in which the king and queen rode was adorned with rich ornamental gems of gold. The king, her father, was at first astonished that his daughter had been so fortunate as she was, till the young king made him sensible of all that happened. Great was the joy at court amongst all, with the exception of the queen and her club-footed daughter, who were ready to burst with malice and envied her happiness, and the greater was their madness, because she was now above them all. Great rejoicings with feasting and dancing continued for many days. Then, at length, with the dowry her father gave her, they returned home. The deformed daughter, perceiving that her sister had been so happy in seeking her fortune, would needs do the same. So disclosing her mind to her mother, all preparations were made, and she was furnished not only with rich apparel, but sweetmeats, sugar, almonds, etc., in great quantities, and a large bottle of Malaga sack. Thus provided, she went the same road as her sister, and coming near the cave, the old man said, Young woman, whither so fast? What is that to you? said she. Then, said he, what have you in your bag and bottle? She answered, Good things, which you shall not be troubled with. Won't you give me some? said he. No, not a bit nor a drop, unless it would choke you. The old man frowned, saying, Evil fortune attend thee. Going on, she came to the hedge, through which she espied a gap, and thought to pass through it. But going in, the hedge closed, and the thorns run into her flesh, so that it was with great difficulty that she got out. Being now in a painful condition, she searched for water to wash herself, and looking round she saw the well. She sat down on the brink of it, and one of the heads came up, saying, Wash me, comb me, and lay me down softly, etc. But she banged it with her bottle, saying, Take this for your washing. So the second and third heads came up, and met with no better treatment than the first, whereupon the heads consulted among themselves what evils to plague her with for such usage. The first said, Let her be struck with leprosy in her face. The second, Let an additional smell be added to her breath. The third bestowed on her a husband, though but a poor country cobbler. This done, she goes on till she came to a town, and it being market day, the people looked at her, and seeing such an evil face fled out of her sight, all but a poor cobbler, who not long before had mended the shoes of an old hermit, who having no money, gave him a box of ointment for the cure of the leprosy, and a bottle of spirits for a stinking breath. Now the cobbler, having a mind to do an act of charity, was induced to go up to her and ask her who she was. I am, said she, the king of Colchester's daughter-in-law. Well, said the cobbler, if I restore you to your natural complexion and make a sound cure both in face and breath, will you in reward take me for a husband? Yes, friend, replied she, with all my heart. With this the cobbler applied the remedies, and they worked the effect in a few weeks, and then they were married, and after a few days they set forward for the court at Colchester. When the queen understood she had married a poor cobbler, she fell into distraction and hanged herself for vexation. The death of the queen was not a source of sorrow to the king, who had only married her for her fortune and bore her no affection. And shortly afterwards he gave the cobbler a hundred pounds to take the daughter to a remote part of the kingdom, where he lived many years mending shoes, while his wife assisted the housekeeping by spinning and selling the results of her labours at the country market. Bolton-upon-Swale, a chapelry in the parish of Catterick, is famous for being the birthplace of Henry Jenkins, who affords such an astonishing instance of longevity as to have been the oldest man born upon the ruins of this post-Diluvian world. He was born in the year 1500 and followed the employment of fishing for 140 years. When about 11 or 12 years old, he was sent to North Allerton with a horse load of arrows for the army of the Earl of Surrey on its march to the north, all the men being then employed at harvest. 
When he was more than 100 years old, he used to swim and wade across the river with the greatest ease and without catching cold. What is the most remarkable, he retained his sight to the last, having made without spectacles two artificial flies for fishing the year before he died. His hearing also continued till his death. Being summoned to give evidence in a tithe cause in 1667, between Charles Anthony, vicar of Catterick and Calvert Smithson, owner and occupier of lands in Kipling, he deposed that the tithes of wool, lamb, and company, mentioned in the interrogatories, were the vicars, and had been paid to his knowledge six score years and more. And in another cause at York, between John Grubham Howe, Esquire, and Mrs. Waystell of Eilerton, about the royalty of the River Swale, he gave evidence to 140 years, previous to Jenkins's going to York, when the agent of Mrs. Waystell went to him, to find out what account he could give about the matter in dispute, he saw an old man sitting at the door, to whom he told his business. The old man said, he could remember nothing about it but that he would find his father in the house, who perhaps could satisfy him. When he went in, he saw another old man sitting over the fire, bowed down with years, to whom he repeated his former question. With some difficulty, he made him understand what he had said, and after a little time got the following answer, which surprised him very much, that he knew nothing about it, but that if he would go into the yard, he would meet with his father, who perhaps could tell him. The agent upon this thought that he had met with a race of antediluvians. However, into the yard he went, and to his no small astonishment found a venerable old man, with a long beard and a broad leathern belt about him, chopping sticks. To this man he again told his business and received such information as in the end recovered the royalty in dispute. As this was a singular piece of service to Mrs. Waystell's cause, which without this man's evidence must have been given to her antagonist, some little annuity might have been settled upon him. But so far from it, that in his old age he went about asking charity and lived the remainder of his life upon very coarse diet. Last one, nobody else is into it. A girl who was leaving her master's service at a farm in the country told her sweetheart that she would meet him near a stile where they had met many times before. This stile was overhung by a tree. The girl got there before him and found a hole dug underneath the tree and a pickaxe and spade lying by the side of the hole. She was much frightened at what she saw and got up the tree. After she had been up the tree a while, her sweetheart came and another man with him. Thinking that the girl had not yet come, the two men began to talk, and the girl heard her sweetheart say, She will not come tonight. We'll go home now and come back and kill her tomorrow night. As soon as they had gone, the girl came down the tree and ran home to her father. When she had told him what she had seen, the father pondered a while and then said to his daughter, We will have a feast and ask our friends, and we will ask thy sweetheart to come and the man that came with him to the tree. So the two men came along with the other guests. In the evening they began to ask riddles of each other, but the girl who had got up the tree was the last to ask hers. She said, I'll read you a riddle, I'll read it you right. Where was I last Saturday night? The wind did blow, the leaves did shake, when I saw the hole the fox did make. When the two men who had intended to murder the girl heard this, they ran out of the house. The Kelpie is the supernatural shape-shifting water horse that haunts the rivers and streams of Ireland and Scotland. It is probably one of the best known of Celtic water spirits and is often mistakenly thought to haunt lochs. In Scotland's Loch Ness is said to have a Kelpie, as well as Loch Nee in Ireland. The creature could take many forms and had an insatiable appetite for humans. Its most common guise was that of a beautiful tame horse standing by the riverside, a tempting ride for a weary traveller, anybody foolish enough to mount the horse. Perhaps a stranger unaware of the local traditions would find themselves in dire peril as the horse would rear and charge headlong into the deepest part of the water, submerging with a noise like thunder to the traveller's watery grave. The Kelpie was also said to warn of impending storms by wailing and howling which would carry on through the tempest. This association with thunder, the sound its tail makes as it submerges underwater, and storms may be related to ancient worship of river and weather deities by the ancient Celts. One of my very favourite Celtic myths. Here are some Kelpie stories from the 1883 edition of the Folklore Journal. Kelpie stories from the north of Scotland by Walter Greger. Kelpie as useful. A man in carting home his peats for winter fuel was in the habit of seeing a big black horse grazing on the banks of the Yuji at Inverugi Castle near Peterhead. Each morning as he passed to the moss, he told some of his neighbours, 
they suspected what the horse was and advised the man to get a waith horse bride, approach the animal with all care and caution and cast the bridle over his head. The man now knew the nature of the creature and followed the advice. Kelpie was secured and did good work in carrying stones to build the bridge at the Yuji at Inveruji. When his services were no longer needed, he was set at liberty. As he left, he said, Serbak and Serben's carried out at the Brigger in Arugi's Steins. The old man, who handed down this story to his children, from one of whom I have now got it, used to say to any of them that complained of being tired after a hard day's work, Oh, I, you're like the Kelpie that care at the Stens to big the Brigger in Arugi, Serbak and Serbanes. Kelpie is hurtful. A miller was annoyed by a Kelpie entering his mill at night and playing havoc among the grain and meal. One night he shut up in the mill his boar, for a miller generally kept a good many pigs and a breeding sow or two. As usual, Kelpie entered the mill. The boar stood on his defense and fought the Kelpie. Next night the creatures appeared at the miller's window and called to him, Is there a chatty in the mill, the nicht? Aye, there is a chatty in the mill, and will be forever mare, was the answer. Kelpie returned no more to the mill. A lad and a lass were taking a journey together. They came to a stream, which they had to cross by a ford. Seeing a white horse grazing on the bank, they thought it would be easier to cross on horseback, if they could but catch the animal, than by wading. They had no difficulty in getting hold of the horse. They mounted and entered the ford. Everything seemed to be going well till they reached the middle of the ford. Then the animal started off at full gallop down the stream. He rushed along with loud haw-hawing and kept shouting now and again, Sit sicker, Jenny Milne, ride fest, Davy, till we win to the bots of Balrevi. Kelpie is commonly spoken of as a black horse. There is a deep pool in the burn of Strichen near the farm of Braco, Aberdeenshire. It was the home of a Kelpie. One evening, a man on his journey home had to cross the stream. It was in flood and the man was brought to a standstill. He saw a horse grazing on the bank. He conceived the idea of mounting him and thus crossing the flooded waters. He went up to the animal, then submitted quite gently and mounted. No sooner was he seated than off the creature ran, plunging along to the deepest part of the pool and dragging his victim with him below the water. Many versions of the Kelpie myth say that the Kelpie's skin secretes some sort of glue or fastener that makes it impossible for their human victim to tear themselves away from the horse, thus assuring their doom. Kelpie in human form. Kelpie sometimes takes the form of a grey, wrinkled old man. A man was crossing the burn of Stricken at the same place, the farm of Braco. On approaching a dike he had to pass over, he heard, as he thought, someone speaking. He walked quietly towards the spot from which the sound of words came and peeped over. He saw an old man mending his trousers, and as he was mending he kept saying, That clout he'll dee here, and this ain I'll dee there. The man looked and listened for a little. At last, he inflicted a blow on the old man's head, saying, And this clout, I'll dee there. In a moment, the Kelpie was in his true form and off with loud neighing to his deep pool. Kelpie seeking human companionship. A young woman was on a journey. Night came down and she lost her way. After wandering a little, she came to a place which seemed likely to give her shelter for the night. She entered and composed herself to such rest as she could draw out of her resting place. By and by, a little dog came and lay down by her side. Shortly after Kelpie made his appearance and said to her, Macbed, bonnie lass, or lie with you the nicht. She was at a loss what to say or do to keep the Kelpie away. The doggy came to her help and told her to say she had no blankets wherewith to make a bed. She said, I have nothing to mac a bed with. Kelpie disappeared but returned after a little and threw into the place where the woman and the dog were, a quantity of bedding, and repeated his former words. He's Hearn, the horned god, Melanie said. Sort of like Pan, you know, a nature god. He's god of animals too. In Irish folklore, Glanconner, meaning love talker, is the fairy version of Casanova. Appearance, a tall, dark and handsome man with pitch black eyes who has a love for smoking pipes, Laura. The Glanconer is an avid womanizer, meeting women in out-of-the-way places, often close to wild nature. As his name suggests, he sweet-talks them until they reach the point where they are putty in his hands. His would-be lovers should beware, 
For most women who succumb to his lustful temptation and sleep with him are usually not long for this world. The fairy will abandon his victim afterward. Most of his castoffs will either go insane and kill themselves, or quietly pine away and die. The few that survive will never be satisfied with the touch of a mortal man. Boggart. In English folklore, a boggart is a household pest which is often described as being squat, hairy, and smelly. It can cause objects to disappear, milk to sour, and dogs to go lame, inability to properly use one or more limbs. Always malevolent, the boggart will follow its family wherever they move, though hanging a horseshoe above the door is said to provide some protection. The boggart should never be named, for when given a name, it cannot be reasoned with and will become uncontrollable and destructive. I hope that you enjoyed tonight's broadcast. If you enjoyed tonight's story, then please subscribe to the channel as more green texts will appear daily. A new broadcast will appear when the clock strikes midnight central time. Remember to check out the Odyssey page in the description for a second archive of the channel's videos. There's also a Rumble archive as a backup.